besides being what some people would call Low Sunday, the Sunday after Easter, good to see you all here, by the way. This is also the Feast of Our Lord, every Sunday or Saturday night, the Feast of Our Lord. But today is not a principal feast day of the church, like Christmas or or Easter, uh, nor a holy day, nor any other major feast day like like St. Paul Day or one of those days. Um, Yet today is filled with tradition, which every staunch Anglican stands upon. Year after year, on the second Sunday after Easter, we have the tradition of hearing the story of Thomas, the disciple who was not there. We even have a special hymn in our hymnal, which some of you are humming along to, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. We will sing it during the offertory tonight, so you're in luck, you're in luck. Because it's only sung the second Sunday of Easter or on St. Thomas Day, December 21st. And this annual reminder is good, because who among us hasn't wrestled with doubt at some time or many times in our life's journey? It is God's providence that we have in the testimony of the apostolic witness, one who St. Gregory the Great has put it, came and heard, heard and doubted, doubted and touched, and touched and believed. In many ways, the doubting of Thomas has done more for modern Christians than it did for the disciples themselves. With that said, I invite us this evening not to dwell on Thomas's doubt, but to enter into the mood of the upper room itself, where all the rest of the disciples were huddled together with the doors locked, wavering in uncertainty, fear, insecurity from the events that had taken place in their prior 72 hours, which we walked through a week ago. Now, you might be saying, Father Christian, come on, we trudged through Lent, we barely made it through Holy Week, we are in Easter now, let's not be a Debbie Downer. Okay. But I beg you, there is light at the end of the tunnel. So it's late Sunday evening in the upper room. The disciples were gathered together, all but Thomas. They were not there having a party, celebrating the news that Jesus had risen. Surely the news of the empty tomb had reached them. Rather, John tells us that the disciples had locked themselves into the upper room because they were afraid. No doubt entertaining thoughts that bred feelings of uncertainty, insecurity, and fear. Indeed, the disciples had something to worry about in their mind, even in the face of good news. Their Jewish brethren had just brought about the death of Jesus, their master, their teacher, their friend, and now they were afraid for themselves. If they took out the teacher, who's next? The students. So there they were, anxious, uncertain, insecure, waiting for what they believed was to come. A knock at the door, footsteps up the stairs, and representatives of the Sanhedrin there to arrest them as co-conspirators and haul them away as they did their Jesus. Now, it has also been suggested that part of the disciples' fear and anxiety could have been directed toward Jesus himself. For just hours before his arrest in that same room, after Jesus had communed with his disciples and made it known that one of them was to betray him and soon he would be going to his death, the disciples were swearing that it would never be them and that they would be willing to die right alongside their Jesus. But when he was taken, who followed? Peter, but at a distance, and denied Jesus three times? Could it be that the disciples were afraid not only of the Jews, but also of Jesus himself? For if he is alive, then what would he say to them? Where were you when I was being beaten? Where were you when I was stumbling my way up to Golgotha? Where were you when I was strung up 
on the cross to die. What would he do to them? He was surely angry at the temple when he chased out the money changers with a whip. So the disciples hid because they were afraid. But we can't criticize. How do we deal with reports that our closest friend and mentor who had just died a most horrible death had also been raised from the dead? How do you process that? He didn't just... He wasn't just in a coma. He hadn't just swooned and fainted. On Friday, he was dead. On Saturday, he was dead. Then Sunday comes, and all of a sudden, he's alive. How do you cope with that? Uncertainty, insecurity, anxiousness, and fear. I read about a psychiatrist and economic teacher, Juliet Scar, who, was sent, who spent some time studying the advertising industry and its attempt to reach younger audiences by its message of buy, 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 scary stuff. Score reports that children as young as 18 months can identify the McDonald's Golden Arches, Disney's Mickey Mouse, The Nike swoosh symbol, all with ease. 18 months. More and more advertisers are aiming adult marketing at children because studies show that children often influence billions of dollars worth of adult purchases. Equally scary, right? In SCORE's surveys, she discovered that the more a child is exposed to advertising and materialism, the more anxious and depressed he or she is. These kids have poor self-esteem, says Score, because the messages they receive from the consumer culture tells them that they are not good enough or they will never be happy enough unless they look a certain way or buy a certain product. Kids are learning at ever younger ages that happiness comes in a box, a bottle, a toy, a piece of clothing, a brand new held, handheld gadget that makes funny sounds. Well, Juliet Score has made the argument that the whole emphasis of the advertising culture is to make us uncertain about ourselves so that we will go out and get whatever is wrong, whatever is wrong with us fixed by buying things. It's all about marketers playing on our fears our uncertainties, our insecurities, that they can make more money off of selling us stuff. Talk about scary stuff tonight. I won't ask for hands, but how many of you are happier when you shop? Or you can give me hands. I know I seem to be. Whenever Kate and I talk about tightening our money belts, I get bummed out because it means I can't shop. Of all the things I would have listed, if someone would have asked me what I was afraid of, not fitting in because I don't have the same thing as Joe Cool down the road would not have been on the list. But it makes perfect sense that in a consumer culture, many people's fears include not having what others have, looking different, not keeping up with the Joneses. So if it isn't keeping up with the Joneses, what are we afraid of? Are any of us afraid of the future? Future for ourselves or our children, our grandchildren? Anyone afraid of failing, of failing health? Anyone afraid of being helpless in a nursing home? going to that dreaded NCH, which I am told stands for never come home? (laughs) Anyone afraid of death itself? Anyone here afraid for your children, wondering how you could possibly go on if something would happen to someone you love? Anyone afraid of losing a spouse? How about the changing society? Afraid of faltering economic climate, 
afraid of terrorism, which seems to be upon our doorstep more and more? Anyone afraid of who's going to be elected next president of the United States of America? Anyone afraid of disappointing our parents? Losing sleep over a troubled marriage? Afraid of failure? Afraid of appearing like a fool? Afraid of what people think of us? Or afraid that people don't really think of us at all? Maybe now we're beginning to sense the mood and the feelings in the upper room of uncertainty, insecurity, anxious fear, which surrounded the disciples that 2,000 years ago. Brothers and sisters, we know the end of the story. Hallelujah, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Thank you. Get you shaken up. We are an Easter people. So suddenly, as the disciples were milling about, scared, anxious, uncertain about things to come, Jesus appears. No sounds, no creeping up the stairs, no slight knock at the door. Poof, he was there standing before them all. As they tremble, Jesus opens his arms wide and says, Peace be to you. The first words out of a beautiful mouth they were longing to hear, that they needed to hear. Peace be to you. Or a better translation, may God give you every good thing. In Hebrew, shalom. And then he breathes on them the Holy Spirit, lavishing on them all that the Prince of Peace brings with him. Contentment, completeness, wholeness, well-being, and harmony. That's what the Prince of Peace brings. It's knowing that in this world of uncertainty, strife, terrorism, pain, politics, death, Christ is risen. And in him, we, have, we are given an abundance of every good gift, bringing about in us contentment, wholeness, harmony, well-being, a shalom, peace. The disciples had heard the news that he had risen, but now they had seen him. He didn't yell. He didn't ask, where were you? Or asking questions. They just sat in his presence and breathed him in like a fragrant offering. And like that, they had the fullness of the Spirit. In them, through them, all around them. And then they were off to tell the good news. Have you ever just sat in here besides on a Sunday or a Saturday night? Have you ever just sat before the altar, before the presence in the tabernacle of Jesus our Lord? If you haven't, I invite you to do so. To sit in here sometime during the week when you can get in because it's locked usually. Come in when the office is open, when there's no one really here. Don't come on a Wednesday. It's usually pretty crazy. Come in and sit when you are free of distraction, when there's no one around, and just breathe in Jesus and the Holy Spirit, saying, come, Lord, come. And you will know the peace that overcame the disciples in the upper room. For if we were to ask some people out and about, even the person next to you, What peace is? Most people would say the absence of something, the absence of war, the absence of conflict, the absence of fear. Some might say the absence of a spouse. That was a joke. (laughs) 
But Holy Scripture tells us that peace is not the absence of something, but the presence of somebody. The presence of somebody. After Jesus had left and Thomas had arrived, he had a hard time believing. It's not that he refused to believe the news. He wanted to believe. Yet the peace he desired eluded him till Jesus came among them once again, eight days later. He said, peace be to you, Brother Thomas. Yet Jesus' presence didn't create faith within Thomas. It simply fanned the flame. It fanned what was already in him because he knew Jesus. The presence of the risen Lord released the faith Thomas already had. For the disciples and for us today, brothers and sisters, peace is a byproduct of the presence of Christ in our midst, in our lives, in our world, in our hearts, that which continues to increase in us faith, hope, and charity, and that which we stand upon as lights in a dark world. Beloved, there is a lot out there in this world that can cause us fear, anxiousness, anxiety. But God has given us something the world cannot give. He gave us his son, the Prince of Peace. And you know, you don't have to sit in this place to find the presence of the Lord, be overcome with the Spirit. It's easier, I believe, because this is a sacred place. But with Christ in and through us and the Holy Spirit, wherever we are, there he is as well. You can have this peace at home in your living room. Just shut off the TV, close your door, go into your room, and call on him. Come, Lord, come. Come, Lord, come. I want contentment. I want completeness. I want wholeness, well-being, harmony, your shalom peace. All we have to do is look for him in our prayers, inwardly digest him in the scriptures, seek him in one another as Christian brothers and sisters, and call on him, come, Lord Jesus, come, and practice the presence of God that we would receive from God every good gift, every good thing, beginning with the peace which passes all understanding. Our shalom peace, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Be present, be present, O Jesus, our great high priest, as you are present with your disciples. Be known to us this day in the breaking of bread, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen.